Kumar, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Good. Thank, thanks a lot for having me here. Um, appreciate it. Yeah. For folks who don't know, uh, Kumar and us, or the entire team at Boyro, we go back many years. Uh, we met him when he had just moved back from the from the US and had uh, reverse uh, um, uh, made that reverse transition. Um, Kumar is the founder and chief product officer of Entropic, and we are very excited to speak to him because. as everyone knows we've been talking about attention and the attention economy in the ad tech industry for quite some time now um so kumar i was wondering if you could just kick us off by telling us a little bit about your journey what got you to entropic what were you doing before that and how's the journey been at entropic itself um shooting so yeah so my name is kumar i'm one of the founders of entropic uh we are in the business of measuring human emotions and human intent at scale uh so before i get into entropic so i come from ad tech background Um, I started out as a product manager uh, working at Yahoo for the Gemini product. That was like back in the day when advertising was starting off. Uh, Yahoo was a huge behemoth back then, um, and then transitioned over to a company called Operator. Was part of the core product founding team there. Um, we were building the ad business management platform for uh, digital platforms, and then slowly into TV. unified uh, tv plus digital um, ad business management platforms is what we are trying to build um was out of operator for about was there at operator for about 6 years moved to a company called integral ad science uh was leading the product initiative for ad fraud side of things um fraud was getting prevalent or just starting to and was getting like i think a bunch of dollars was actually getting wasted pretty much and nobody knew what was actually happening so uh with durability brand safety the next frontier was fraud so i was leading there and then spent some time with double verify from a consulting standpoint uh, again fraud ad fraud side of things um and then one fine day said okay we've been here in us for about 10 12 years or so what next continue to be a product manager or in the product management side and then i uh, ranjan and i ranjan is one of the other founders here at entropic so we started talking about different things uh in terms of what can we do anything interesting new ranjan just had an exit from his previous startup um and he was also kind of like pretty much empty handed at that point both of us were like figuring out what to do next and stuff i was like okay let me try to move back to india and uh, we stumbled into this idea of what interesting can be done in terms of measurement what interesting can be done in terms of personalization in the atex space and that that's pretty much how entropic got started so uh, anand since you you are like one of the veterans in this space uh, in the ad tech side of things uh so typically targeting is done using standard set of parameters right gender demographic um interest historical uh websites uh patterns and all that stuff standard cookie data that you sync uh and all the thing and that's how you basically depending on what site you go to based on who you are what your interests are what you've done in the past uh whichever dmp has your data to a closest extent you see some ads accordingly the underlying thesis at entropic was what if we could show ads that are dynamically changing based on your emotions not just based on who you are um gender age income location zip code interest and stuff but add emotion as a layer to it if you're happy and the content around you is also happy the content that you're reading is happy can i show emotions that are more positively dispensable mm-hmm. and the same thing with negative and stuff right so we want to kind of start thinking about that and that's how entropic was born um so yeah entropic is a human insights company we primarily focus on being able to measure yeah. people's emotion at scale um so what it means is that we analyze your facial expressions using a camera that's there in your laptop mobile phone or in a retail sense all security cameras that are there anywhere deployed uh we analyze your voice tone based on the tone the frequency the pitch in which the way you speak uh we can tell you whether you're having a positive experience negative experience are you happy sad uh, different emotions in that spectrum uh we can also tell you what in the screen you're looking at using again standard camera and your laptop mobile phones with eye gaze predictions and the last one is obviously text sentiment analysis which is based on the word choices that you use we can obviously there's plenty of people who can do that so what we do is we bring in all of these four different modalities to tell exactly at any point in time at any frame in time at any second in time what a user is actually feeling seeing expressing 
when you're looking at an ad, when you're looking at a product, when you're looking at a package, when you're walking through a retail store, when you're tasting a food biscuit or a chip, or even cooking something, right? So, or driving a car, different multiple use cases is where it comes in. So we focus on two specific verticals. One is market research. Uh, we basically work with brands like P&G, Unilever, all, all sorts of brands across the globe to help them understand consumer behavior at scale. And the second vertical that we focus on is user research. Um, we work with uh, all new new age brands, new tech companies, anybody who has a website or a mobile app who's looking at optimizing that particular website or an app. It could be internal, external. We support them throughout the user journey, uh, user experience research cycle in terms of telling what your potential drop-offs are, where people are getting frustrated, where your conversions are actually taking a hit. Um, and we add the layer of emotion AI across all of these different aspects yeah. to tell that. I think the one thing that makes a lot of sense to me is as I look at the trajectory of your career, um, you have spent time at the core of some of the topics that the whole industry is talking about, right? Um, you went from an ad management platform to viewability, to brand safety, to fraud, to then now focusing on attention, right? For me, if I were to map the trajectory of the ad tech industry, that's pretty much how it, it the conversation has been changing yeah. for obvious reasons, right? Having spent a lot of time building technology, we are a product that's very much like operator, right? We're in a uh, business management suite. Um, both as consumers as well as providers of technology, we're aware of the fact that we're all just flirting with the tip of the iceberg if we keep talking about targeting or cohorts the way we currently do it. Um, I read a stat the other day that said 60% or 65% of the effectiveness of a campaign is actually dependent on the creative. Creative, yeah. Not the targeting, not anything else. Yeah. And yeah. that... Um, um, obviously that itself is the tip of the iceberg because there's so much you can measure within that, right? There's an emotional response to it. Yeah. There's an emotional relationship between uh, uh, humans and a brand. Um, there are so many brands that just evoke a very different reaction in me subconsciously. Yeah. And um, I think from that perspective, we are very excited about what you're building because just what you said right now, there is a different emotion at different points in time. And, and can we create an experience around that when it yeah. comes to what ad we show a user? Uh, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking to Arjun Koladi, who's at Spotify. And Spotify has a very similar take, which is when it comes to audio, it's a very intimate experience between us and um, a song. And you're inviting a brand to participate in that experience. And so you have to respect the underlying emotion. I may be listening to happy music, yeah. death metal trash metal something very very somber you don't want a brand jumping in there and kind of ruining their image so there's yeah. an emotional relationship that actually drives the entire purchasing yeah. funnel so i think from that perspective we are very excited about what you're building because we think it's it's necessary but what i'm curious to know more about and we'll talk about it is where are we on this journey as an industry right but before we get into that you mentioned market research and user research as two core areas where entropic functions. Um, how many products do you currently have and who buys these products? So um, so we have two products uh, built on a core platform. So one is Decode, which is a market research end-to-end -end integrated stack. Um, the second one is Catalyst, which is end-to-end -end user research stack. Um, so when it comes to Decode, our um, customer base is typically any CPG brand that you can think of or anyone who's interested in understanding consumer behavior, um, either for their products or for the ads, it could be media houses like, let's say, Z, Star, Disney, Netflix, mm -hmm. Amazon Prime, all of these but guys. Who, who at the brand? Is it the CMO? It's, it yeah. So Decode is very focused on CMO organization. So within CMO, there's a group called CMI, Consumer Marketing Insights or Consumer Insights. So it's a CMO, CMI org, but all of them roles under CMO for Decode. And Catalyst is very specific to a CPO org. Um, hmm. Your product managers, UX designers, usability engineers, chief product hmm. officer, that's that's the ICP um, yeah. that we target predominantly. Okay. Okay, and Catalyst is still for the CPG sector or is that broader? No, Catalyst is more uh, across, uh, irrespective, of who, irrespective of what vertical it is, anybody who has a website or a mobile app hmm. that want to, like at different stages in your design life cycle, right? From your mockups to prototypes to 
live websites yeah. to revamp that that's a cycle that everybody goes through right be it Expedia yeah. be it us our website goes through every every nine months mm-hmm. to a year once keep changing it our platforms keep changing it platforms keep yeah. evolving so we bring in our consumers our customers into the research loop understand what works what doesn't work where people get frustrated what people want yeah is the platform actually doing that effectively right so so, that's so the other piece. what what is your gut reaction to Twitter changing itself to X. Is, is, is that something that was well thought through in your opinion? I, I had a very negative emotional response to the change. Um, I'm irritated by it, but I love the product, so I'll keep using it. But every time I, I, I actually can't find the app anymore on my phone because I keep looking for the blue <laughs> bird, which I've done for 15 years on my yeah, phone. Yeah. And now I'm not able to find the app. No, so I, I have a different perspective on that. Um, I, I like to see things change more frequently then be it uh, stagnant. So I, I love the new X for all uh, intents and purposes, whether good, bad, ugly. Uh, I, I, I like it. And I think there's probably, um, I mean, given Elon, given his, what he has proved to the world with all the SpaceX, Tesla, Neuralink, all the other stuff that's going on. I mean, he's not average Joe who's just going to take things off, throw it out of the window, mm-hmm. right? So there's obviously some method to the madness that, we are not seeing yet is what at least I'm firmly believing in. Uh, I might be completely wrong as well, but it's just uh, Elon being Elon, um, I think. And to a certain extent, it makes sense. I was just like browsing Instagram this morning while coming to office. One of the interviews that he did with uh, US channels is that he has fired about 80% of the staff. So he just said that hey, 20% is more than sufficient to run Twitter unless we try to run this glorified activist organization. And if you think from a pure engineering product standpoint, that totally makes sense. There's not a whole lot of stuff that Twitter has done over the last, let's say, seven, eight years, right? Once the Twitter went out, Twitter ad stack went out to serve ads, sell ads programmatically, there hasn't been anything much beyond that. Obviously, some content moderation, yeah. content moderation anonymization, a lot of other stuff happened, but nothing, nothing phenomenal has happened in that space, right? So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting something bigger uh, yeah. to happen. So, yeah. yeah. But but if it were not Elon, are you, you're basically saying you would expect a company like Twitter to use Catalyst, understand the change uh, in user journey, and then make a shift like this, as opposed to tweeting overnight. Yeah, overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. De- definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, hundred uh, <laughs> percent. There has to be data-driven decisions, and where is the data yeah. coming from? Understood. And, but it can apply to any product, a tech product, a package any, of chips, anything, anything, Correct. anything, anything. So we, okay. we work with sometimes small cookies that goes out into market to milkshakes all mm. the way till, I mean, in probably the middle, there's garam masalas and chili powders as well that huge mm. brands actually make like a bill, billion and a half, mm. billion, mm. billion and a half in revenue, just purely on that in the Indian market yeah. mm. um, and to high end websites um, like yeah. Netflix or Amazon Prime or any of the yeah. e-commerce players. Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears and just talk about attention. Um, yeah. We have started to see it everywhere, right? And periodically, the ad tech industry wakes up to, to a new trend and it becomes a hot topic. But there's some of these topics that I'm a big believer in, right? The realization that widespread fraud exists. Um, I remember when viewability came around and the, the, the moat uh, started to make a name yeah. for themselves. But it started to make instant sense, right? The fact that yeah. even in the world of connected TV today, there is this, uh, uh, there's a lot of it, uh, uh, talk around ads that show when the television is off, right? And it might seem trivial, but at scale, these are the kind of things that we wake up yep. to as an industry, right? So we are starting to see a lot more uh, 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 attention, lack of a different word, to the fact that brands, publishers, Everyone is waking up to the fact that there is a whole world beyond viewability um, to be able to understand whether or not a creative is effective, where attention is being spent, why is it being spent, at what point, is it on the product, is it on the person endorsing the ad, is it a specific moment? Why do you think it's catching steam now? Like this, why 2023? Um, I think probably two or three things, right? So one is viewability has always been an intermediary step rather than a final step just because of technological advancements and uh, the the pain point back then when 
I, I remember still vague, like very, very clearly meeting Jonah Goodhart, one of the founders of uh, Mode uh, at the operator office uh, when his team was about, I think, six, seven people, eight people, the max, trying to do an integration with the operator. Um, this was like, what, 2009-ish or 2010-ish early. We were like, just people are still transacting on CPC, CPA. Hmm. CPM is a big step. Um, and like now we're talking about viewability is like, like very, very difficult to sell. Uh, but then over a year, things transitioned, started transitioning pretty aggressively because the amount of dollars that actually flow through is phenomenal in the ad tech mm-hmm. ecosystem, um, right? So viewability temporarily solved the problem to see whether people really are seeing the ad or not seeing the ad, but it is still a pseudo metric to measure yeah. some, right? Like it's just purely based on how much time a particular portion of an ad is actually in the screen or not on the screen. Uh, it doesn't still tell you are bots seeing it or humans really seeing it. Um, uh, or like I could have multiple slots within my homepage. I could still not be seeing an ad. I could be seeing something else in the homepage yeah. and still that gets countered. Somebody is actually paying for it. There's multiple taxes that gets deducted as a part of the overall transaction chain that actually happens in that tech space. Um, so obviously as brands started spending more and more, brands start seeing value. They want to start mm-hmm. seeing accountability. And the only way to get more and more clear accountability is to understand the ad that I'm putting so much effort in, is that really seen by humans? Hmm. If it is really seen by humans, what, what kind of, what ad slots are actually more visible than compared to other ad slots? Because not everything is equal uh, when it comes to a homepage of a particular uh, yeah. website, uh, right? So I, I think the, the quality of inventory um, has, or not the quality, inventory as a whole has like probably many fold increased i don't know what the percentage terms are i'm, I'm sure it's probably like triple, triple digits high north of um high triple digits given the amount of inventory that's actually going in every day there's some website or the other coming up with news articles yeah. focusing on some specific sector and stuff so where do you advertise what do you advertise how do you make sure what you're advertising is actually reaching the right audience right so this attention as a mechanism more so than anything is like are people really seeing it are my internet yeah. audience really seeing it right that's that's yeah. the question that brands want to get answered yeah. very clearly so so the one question that always pops up in my head is is it even measurable right oh. now if we were to break this down into first principles i'll use a different example right let's say i have a billboard on the street and i charge you a certain amount for it and i say hey five million people walk past that billboard every day right of the people that walk past, how many stop and look? Of the people that notice, yeah. how many look? Sorry. Of the people that notice, how many look? Of the people that look, how many actually digest that information, right? But it seems like something that's next to impossible to measure in a digital world because unless you're pausing my experience and forcing me to see an ad, yeah. um, there is, I wonder how you can know if someone is not just, it's the same funnel, right? There's a... I, I I recently learned about the metric called OTS opportunity to serve. Opportunity to serve yep. But between OTS <laughs> and whether or not I consume the information in the ad enough yeah. to create intent or foster intent or, or what it is. I, I was listening to another podcast the other day with the founder of Lumen, um, mm-hmm. where he basically yep. said nobody advertises to get their ad seen. You advertise because yep. you Agree, want yeah. a conversion at the end of the day, right? Agree. Maybe three hops away, but this eventual yep. goal is to get someone's attention. Yep. And in the world of digital, there is an equivalent of that billboard example. Right? There's an opportunity to serve. Then you serve an ad. We all talk about what happens beyond, behind that. The ad networks, yep. the ad yep. tax, yep. the yep. buyers. Forget all of that. After it's served, right? there is again What's a similar impact? funnel. Yep. There's a similar funnel. Right? I can be served the ad. It can be viewable, but I can totally ignore it and focus on the content because that's the reason I'm great, there to great. begin with. Yep. So effectively, it is something that's trying to divert my attention either by interrupting my experience or by augmenting it. But how do you measure attention? And in the same vein, are you doing it in real time or is it done on a panel and therefore you're effectively measuring the attention of the creative itself and not that ad as it's served? So, um, I mean, if you take a step back for a second, right? So there are three C's that at at Entropic that we see, uh, right? One is a creative, the second one is context, the third one is channel. Uh, mm-hmm. These are all the three different places in which attention can effectively be measured and monetized to a certain extent to make sure there's ROI. 
to the person who's actually spending or putting dollars into this, right? So creative is definitely a huge piece, as you said, 65% of the decision making or an intent to make an engagement of sorts is actually driven by creative. Um, what we have seen is 95% of your decision making happens subconsciously. Only 5% is based on your rational thinking. And the subconscious driven decisions are purely emotional driven decisions that people tend to make based on what you see, what you felt about what you saw, et cetera, right? So there's obviously attention measurement that can be done from a creative standpoint, which is, yeah, I have multiple variations of creative. I could do an A-B test, a multivariate test, or expose the particular creative standalone or in context, measure people's emotions to see what people like, what people didn't like, all of that stuff. It's all pre-testing is what is typically called as. I'll basically come up with a really, really, really good ad that has high attention, high engagement, right emotion intent with all the research that I can do and put it out, right? So the first question or first check mark is actually done with respect to creative. Context, I think I have some information about context depending on what brand I'm advertising with, what website I'm advertising with, with the brand safety guidelines and all the um, guardrails that are there. I can, to a certain extent, measure the context, the, what is there in the website and the ad, are they going together? Are they going against each other? how far apart they are. And for each and every page, you can also start measuring your emotion scores also to make sure at that particular level, if an ad is, unfortunately, let's say, for example, uh, you don't want to be advertising Coke, just for lack of a better example, uh, next to uh, an accident related to news article. Mm -hmm. Just these two should not go together. It just creates a bad, bad negative experience from a brand standpoint for somebody consuming that seeing the ad of Coke next to a, an accent, right? Implicitly, you start creating associations which shouldn't be happening, and that is not something that brand wants to also have you create. Coke is always about joy. Coke is always about energy. Coke is always about positivity. Mm -hmm. That's where the colors, the sound, a lot of stuff actually goes into it from a theory standpoint, right? The third one, uh, which is a um, channel, uh, where channel, when I say it could be mobile, websites, the different placements, all of that stuff, um, that's that's the piece where whether you do it real time, whether you do it through a panel, use the data to extrapolate. Um, again, we have been talking about this with a lot of agencies across the globe uh, in terms of this attention as a measurement. There's two schools of thought. I don't think anybody has kind of agreed upon which school of thought should actually go ahead with. Uh, people are looking at more from a deployment solution standpoint to make it make life a little bit easier so that you could scale things, um, not necessarily to get the highest possible attention, best possible attention measured, uh, right? So even if you look at Attention Council, which is a group that was formed with a bunch of brands, mm -hmm. bunch of tech companies there, um, there are three different types of companies at play within the Attention Council. This company, mm -hmm. which focuses purely on facial emotion measurement or facial coding and using that mm -hmm. data to measure people's attention, on a creative, on a website, when you're browsing through something. There's a second uh, set of companies which actually are putting a hardware device in your home, measuring, are you looking at uh, the ads in the TV? Are you looking at the shows? Are you skipping all of that stuff? Are you looking at the ads? Are you looking at your mobile phone? Well, an ad is actually mm -hmm. going on and using that to cal calculate attention. Um, the third set of technology vendors that we are seeing in this space is also eye tracking. Uh, huh. Eye tracking, uh, again, purely where I have a panel of people, I'll expose a certain set of creatives or I expose a certain set of websites with different ad slots defined. I'll just let them browse naturally what they're browsing on in like a couple of days once or more periodically, whatever the different intervals are that each and every one prefers it to be. Then based on that data, they can tell whether um, a 300 by 250, a skyscraper or a 600 by 250 or, or whatever different ad formats are, which format actually gets the most attention units or attention data mm -hmm. points or whatever the metric is, right? So there's no standardization yet, but which slots actually get the highest attention consistently over a statistical significant number and once I have enough data on eye tracking, then I use that data to build a predictive eye tracking model where any mm. new website comes in or any new slot comes in, I'll quickly be able to tell you whether this particular slot is going to give you attention or not, what level of attention on a scale of 0 to 5, 0 to mm. 10, whatever the measurement, uh, measurement mm. scale is. 
tell you, does it fit into a five? Does it fit into one? Does it fit into a 10? There's a lot of, like, even if it's below the fold, there are still some slots, which actually still gets high attention compared to like a, a banner on certain websites, right? So depending on all of these things, you can actually measure attention that way. Um, so when we look at it, I think we still believe either a combination of facial coding and eye tracking or standalone eye tracking. You can also do eye tracking in real time, right? I could just basically turn on your camera, ask for permission to turn on your camera when you're browsing, let's say wiro.com or entropic.io. And while you're browsing, I can like start looking and measuring where you're seeing what you're seeing, where you're not seeing mm -hmm. also. And mm -hmm. based on where you're seeing, I can in real time increase the CPM or the bid rate for the particular slot aggressively compared to other slots, which I'm not actually getting attention to, which means mm -hmm. in programmatically, dynamically change the pricing based on attention data, right? I think, I think it's probably a little bit more of evolution that might happen um, there. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is probably like a science fiction uh, so kind of very black black mirror kind of right? <laughs> correct but i don't think it's difficult right computer vision has computer vision advancements are so much that yeah. it's not difficult to predict eye tracking data in real time if the camera is turned off it's really really fast all happens in milliseconds which means your transaction can also happen in that milliseconds and serve you the right ad based on your browsing eye gaze patterns understood um while a lot of what you, I like the way you broke it down, the creative context and channel, right? There was a there was a report that came out recently by the ANA that said the average campaign shows itself on forty four thousand websites, right? Yep. Sounds like context and channel are something that are hard to control if that continues to happen. Do you see that reducing as advertisers get sharper about where they want their ad to show? I think they should. Um, I mean the more the better or the wider the better theory has been thrown out of the window a couple of times in the yeah. past right so i think if you are a brand you're spending money to have your ad put in the right place you want to be very selective about where you want to yeah. put it you want to be very selective to make sure that that particular ad is reaching the right audience at the right time and is garnering the high attention that's supposed to be right so obviously premium inventory is where the most of the data points yeah. that you can actually get rather than just programmatically buying from all sorts of places yeah. available. So your first look inventory or premium inventory where if I'm buying today as a part of my programmatic buying, I can add these attention metric as a layer on top of it. Before I make a decision to go bid or go buy, hmm. I can quickly look up for this particular ad slot, for this particular website, for this particular page, what is attention score? If the attention score is greater than let's say, eight out of 10, then I'm ready to go buy it. I'm ready to pay a premium for it. If it's less than three, I don't even want to touch, right? Each and every brand will have to come up with their own scale in terms of what works for them, what doesn't work for them. Hmm. And accordingly have to go to market with that. Yeah. Um, it's been many years since we've seen advancements in AI as well as pure play machine learning, but obviously between in the last 10 to 12 months, it has received a lot more attention with specifically generative AI getting uh, easier to access both for consumers as well as for businesses, right? Do you expect to see on the back of that more action in this space, more companies trying to solve problems here because of new capabilities that OpenAI and Llama and Bard are creating or, or is generative AI not, not connected to this space at all? Um, there are probably flavors to it. Uh, so for example, um, your creative, like with all the stable diffusion models from mid journey or other aspects of it, that definitely has a big impact in terms of what kind of creatives you can actually create, how soon you can actually do a creative refresh. If it's going to take about two yeah. hours in the past, it can be done in like two seconds, yeah. right? I don't really have to wait, wait. So the dynamic changing of ads based on yeah. my, uh, my browsing patterns can actually become a, in a not so distant future can actually happen at a much, much faster pace, right? The problem has always been supply side, right? I cannot put out so many creatives at once. I go through my design cycle. I probably have about eight, 10 creatives for this month or this week I've created. For the next week, my team is already working on it, right? So yeah. if I can create 100 creatives in a day <laughs> or even 1,000 creatives in a day, it's all automated. And if I can directly pipe, let's say, a stable diffusion model to my ad slot, and based yeah. on who's actually looking at it, I create custom ads every single time you go to a website. 
only for you and that ad is not repeated yeah. uh it's it's a different scale right so that's it one is, piece you know it is because i also th- going back to what you said earlier right i i may be uh, i this may be an unpopular opinion but if coca cola shows an ad against uh, an accident article i personally don't judge coca cola for it i'm like the, the, the news is the news and and, and the, i don't i don't say, i don't hold coke against the fact that they bought an ad versus because news is not always going to be hunky dory and yeah. in my opinion who should show an ad against the accident is it an insurance company like that's worse for me <laughs> right so i i don't necessarily know but but i definitely think that coca cola can show a more somber ad not an yeah, ad yeah. that's gotten people dancing in the middle of the street right how far are we from something like this where a stable diffusion model can basically be piped into an ad request or into the bit mm-hmm. stream so you're not just looking at pure play targeting metrics but you're also as part of the request figuring out not just who what? the advertiser should be but what the flavor of the ad is based on the mood of the person or yeah. the context of the article either as the case might be how far are we from that probably 6 months to a year given how generative ai is actually shaping up uh, wouldn't be That's surprised nice. to yeah. see if uh, dynamic ads getting thrown out on a super super fast pace yeah 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 that's fun that's fun. i i like it that's fun <laughs> yeah. um before we jump to the the last segment um in all these years of of running and tropic you've obviously gotten some very cool insights into how we operate as human beings what are some of the funniest insights you've learned when it comes to our attention if you could share a couple of anecdotes so um i mean most of the data is proprietary data that brands actually own um let's say for example uh, in a very very simplest terms is like we used to do a study for a lot of large brands in india um how garam masala is perceived with housewives uh we thought it's just garam masala uh, whether not south east west just india right just as an example of how important it is it's almost like people uh, like if it's not there if it's not the right brand if it's not sitting next to the right brand if it's not the right dial people have so much negative emotion that they exhibit hmm. and if it if the pack ingredients that are there if it's not highlighted correctly people automatically tend to make decisions right let's say for example if it's the garam masala in the indian sense you will have that big uh, bowl with all small bowls inside it yeah. you have all these different yeah. that's a historical way garam masala's grandmother great grandmother used to put it together manually crunch it and use it right yeah. if that is not there in a packet people won't buy it people mm. think it's not a garam masala it's it's artificial mm. colors play a substantially important role which obviously the pn pure are like uh, proven a lot over and over again but colors with symbols let's say for example a rising sun on a green tea horizon behind the mountains makes things a mm-hmm. lot more organic. Ah, so okay. this the smaller nuances that people like any pack that you today see in the market yeah uh, from your biscuits to salts to example garam masala chocolate yeah. there's a science to it. Uh yeah. they have they've done so much research that it this color means something and in dairy milk has been a popular that everybody mm-hmm. in India can relate to right that purple mm-hmm. color always means happiness with chocolate yeah yeah like if you see purple it's dairy milk that's like you can they own they own the color own the <laughs> correct which is my thing with twitter they own blue and they're just given it up I, it's like it, i can't look for that black color app now anymore black, it's, it's yeah. very hard for me um what but i go back to app? something i think it's talking so. about super app yeah yeah i I don't know. I hope that within the super app they still hold on to the Twitter brand. Um at some point but it hasn't stopped me from using it. I still seek it out and kind of find it. I'm not going to use yeah. threads. It's not oh, no. for me. Yeah. I've spent I years give up. I give up. I spent years curating Twitter and I get that that curation is not something everyone's willing to do but I've put in the hard work. Now I'm not going to suddenly <laughs> expose myself to thousands of unknown content creators. Um I go back to something you said earlier which is that 95% of our decisions are subconscious and not rational and I think that makes so much sense things like the color and things like the mood and things like uh the visuals and the ingredients I think the the science of being able to influence a subconscious decision is what is what this is yeah. all about when it comes to media buying 
um, while there is a lot of this that can influence the creative itself, whether that's dynamically rendered or rendered in advance, is there a correlation between doing that and your click-through rates or your ad campaign performance? Can you know, is it a useful enough proxy for you to improve the efficiency with which you buy or spend money? 100%. 100% with certainty. I have always so, been very, very miffed about the fact that this whole industry considers 0.5% to be a good click-through rate. I have hated it. I've always yeah. wondered why we celebrate when oh, I got 0.8%, like True. give this guy a promotion, right? Is that is there a way that this can just take that up a couple of notches? Yeah, so more than, I think still click-through rate is an artificial or a pseudo um, metric to track against. Right? See, at the end of the day, why am I spending money in advertising? I want to either have somebody buy my product or I want to create an experience or engagement or at some point, any time in the future, whenever you are in the shop, you are, if not now, in the future, you want to buy something and you are on the aisle, first thing that I want you to think about is me as a brand. And that's the engagement I want you to connect, right? So over a period of three exposures, five exposures, whatever the frequency cap and frequency period and stuff, and the type of brand, type of message, type of colors, all of that stuff is going to influence a consumer towards making the decision. Short term, mid term, long term, different aspects to it, right? So um, click through rate has been a pseudo metric to measure outcome of a yeah. um, outcome of a campaign. Um, so when we when we started Entropic and over the period of time that we have been about seven and a half, close to seven and a half years now. Um, we have very clearly seen sales increase or loyalty increase purely based on the creative efficacy or the attention of a creative. Okay. From an engagement standpoint of PR, from an attention standpoint, if either of these two are high, we see a very clear correlation to outcomes. Direct increase in your sales or direct increase in your brand loyalty. And then um, we have enough data to prove it out in terms of what yeah, we've seen no, with all the brands. I don't doubt it. Do you think we're far away from a world where attention is actually a currency that's used to buy ads, as opposed it, to it, all it these pseudo metrics? Yeah, no, I think um, the proxies. In, in fact, um, just a brief uh, detour. So when Ranjan and I, I think I remember about four years ago, we started thinking about, hey, maybe emotion is a currency that we should have ad tech play around um, instead of stuff. And why would anybody move away from a CPM or a CPC uh, into an emotion-based metric? Or it's another metric on top of it from a currency transaction. I think the way the world is now evolving, um, the future is definitely going to be attention. I, I don't think that is a fad or anything. Uh, it's definitely something that's going to change. Um, I mean, you saw viewability, brand safety, and fraud. viewability as a whole brought in the next set of companies which actually are in the billion dollar revenue range, be it mm -hmm. Moat, Double Verify, Integral Ad Points, Integral Ad Science. Uh, there's a bunch of other companies who are also in this space, all in the north of 100 mil kind of an ARR, public mm -hmm. listed as well, some of them these days. I think attention is going to do that, bring, bring that next wave of companies yeah. into this space um, whether they're going to do it with eye tracking real panel facial coding a combination of this uh, that's that's probably something that time will tell based on uh, the scale that one can yeah. bring to the table uh, but yeah. it, this is this this is definitely here to stay no i i agree and i think it's time that the proxies kind of died down yeah. because there's too many of them and i wonder if they're canceling each other out i think the next thing um, right so like i'm some sometimes i mean like some of the friends that we talk to in the ad tech space uh, from my operative days what next after attention uh, right so mm -hmm. there's one step that probably about three years ago there was a lot of talk about direct sale conversions as a measurement that mm -hmm. some companies were claiming that if you advertise through my platform i can tell exactly what the uplift in sales is mm -hmm. which is a holy mm -hmm. grail for any advertising uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I think this is probably one more step towards the direction. Uh, yeah. Either right after that sales conversion, or there's one more or two more step in between. Don't know, but I think this is something that's definitely needed because unless humans see it, humans feel it, humans engage with it, there's no point in having an ad out there. Yeah, I think otherwise we'll end up living in a world of proxies, right? Yeah, whether it's click-through rates or view-through rates, or 
in my opinion even the fact that advertising against premium content is more mm-hmm. expensive I and mean, premium content can still have very poor attention I, yeah, exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No. um fantastic this has been fun i've learned a lot uh thank you so much and we wish you and everyone at entropic the very best we're very excited to see what you guys keep coming up with thank you thank you so much for having me here i uh, really appreciate it again good to good to chat again yeah always thanks lava bye bye thank you